So here's our review of the Dehancer plugin for Resolve. And it's given me a reason to get out my old cameras. Uh, here's a 35, 36 year old EOS one, and here's a, uh, a Mamiya RB67. And I actually have no idea of how old this is. But back in the day when I used to use these cameras, I would use a whole different range of film depending on what photographs I wanted to take. And I remember that I gravitated towards Velvia, and in particular the 50 ISO uh, Velvia. And then for this cam camera, it was the Provia, the, um, the 100. And this is what Dehance is about. It's about that non-linear transform that you get when you take a photograph with film. It's about the way the light comes through the lens, the way it hits the film, the way it goes through the layers of film, the way it bounces back. And this gives you um, some colour casts, it gives you uh, grain, it gives you bloom, it gives you halation, and if it's in a cine camera, it gives you gate and it gives you weave, and depending on the age of the lens, it will give you uh, a degree of vignetting. And it's interesting to think that these days we spend more and more money trying to get away from the artifacts that these films um, would have introduced just to buy a plug-in to put them all back in again afterwards. So out of interest, I went and got out some of my uh, very old shots that I would have taken on these cameras, which are taken on Velvia 50 normally, and then printed in Cibachrome. And as I look at them, I don't see any grain at all. And I'm seeing, you know, very good, very good renditions of the reds and the other colours and even in reasonably dark conditions like this indoor shot there isn't any grain at all yeah uh, let me just have a good look at this yep there's no grain at all in this and what i did do is just for interest i included a grab shot um which would have been taken with the eos one and again this was taken in the dark conditions and i probably can just about detect a little bit of really soft grain in the uh, bokeh areas. But the thing is, is that film, because it's got an analog process in it, it's very forgiving of the extremes. And then what it allows you to do is it allows you to bind together uh, images or it allows you to create a feeling. And I remember as I was going through this stuff and I was using uh, Joe and Clover as models, as they were walking past, they were looking at my um, screen and going, oh, I like that. Oh, I like that. Oh, I like that. Because it's reminding them of either very old shots that they've seen of themselves as a family or it's reminding them of the Instagram look. Anyway, I also had a call round a few of my friends, in particular Anthony, who uses uh, Dehancer, and he sings the praises of just the grain. He says Dehancer is worth it just for the grain alone. Anyway, let's show you some of the things that I tried with the Dehancer plugin. Right then, here we go. Let's start looking at um, what Dehancer does inside Resolve. So I've placed it on. The first thing I've got to do, because my project is in ACES, I've got to say that the input is in ACES. So I'm just switching it on and off so you can see. And here you can see that huge uh, variety of films that you've got available. Um, and I know that in here somewhere, there's a black and white film that I want to use. This is uh, part of a little project I was doing about Sarah Angelina Ackland that I'll come to. There's Polaroid. Is that, does that look? the way Polaroid, the way you remember it, but I know that there is a old film in here which is black and white, um, and I was, uh, there's a variety of black and white films, but it's not Kodachrome. Um, as I remember it, it is right down the bottom, oh, that's just out of curiosity because I used to use Agfa, does that look like Agfa to me? 
Mm, I'm not sure. Anyway, right down the bottom here somewhere, it's this famer type. Yep, this is the black and white film. And so now what I want to do is I want to start making this black and white film look like it's a black and white film from sort of, uh, I don't know, 1915, which is around about the time that Angelina, Sarah Angelina Ackland would have been coming to this particular house. Right. So what we're doing is switching on and off the bloom. And if you look at the posts on the house, you can see how they're coming, kind of coming up and down. Um, I don't want quite so much bloom. Well, maybe I do actually, because um, those old films would be, the bloom would be caused by light hitting the back of the film and then bouncing back again. So let's just have a look at that. That looks kind of okay. Um, Next thing I want to do is make it look like it's sort of more deeply printed, really. So I'm going to just swing on the black point a little bit. I like these controls, by the way. Um, you, it, it, If you um, wipe over the number, you get a finer control than moving the actual pointer. Right, let's get all the bits on to make it look old. Uh, film grain. Let's get this looking good and distressed. I think we need more film grain. I think that's the right kind of... Yeah, I mean, that's beginning to look well messed up. Perhaps more messed up than it should do. And uh, there are other options as well. Anyway, the other thing I wanted to do is get us that old Dariaga type colour thing. So once again, I'm going to put the uh, Dehancer mode on. Actually, I quite like it when it's in it kind of looks old when it's in Rec 709, which it shouldn't be. So let's put it right, and then let's see if we can find the right kind of film type or the right kind of options. I'm just going to switch off grain. I'm just switching in and off. Switch off grain because I find that without the grain, it's easier for me to evaluate the kind of colours that we're getting. Um, there is this 1906 experimental film here somewhere. It does make you wonder if Dehancer actually managed to get hold of some old stock from 1906 and, and, and work with it. That's the stuff. That red is looking more red than I'd expect. Let's get the grain on and push the size up. Push the, ah, that is too much. That's too much. Yeah, there we go. Uh, it's kind of all right. It's looking like an old film. And let's put the vignette on because all the old cameras would have vignetted a bit. And then let's get the film breath and the gate weave on. And that's because film wouldn't perfectly run through the film gate on the sprockets back in the day. Um, let's have a go with expand just to see if we can get it to look a bit more, um, a bit old. Yeah, it's definitely looking old. It's definitely looking old. Perhaps a little bit too much resolution because as I'm looking at it, I'm seeing the bricks in the uh, in the uh, in the distance there, and they're looking mm, better than they should do. Ah, now this color head thing. This does allow us uh, to mess around with the colors, and it kind of emulates what happens to film if you leave it <coughs> in different chemicals for different amounts of time. So, you know, those old films definitely weren't very good at colour rendition. And, yeah, I think that's looking more... Yep. Oh, the analogue limiter, which limits the top range. Not sure if I want that in or out, actually. Uh, but, yeah, we'll leave it like that. Okay, so off to the next thing, which is uh, looking at how we can use the exposure controls uh, which are in the expand and the print section and they are reasonably easy to use. I mean you can do gross things with them like this which is ridiculous but in the smaller areas I find that they're quite nice to use. I mean you can compare this with using the contrast control for example, in Resolve, and you'll find that you don't move that an awful lot and you get a lot more change. So this is giving you a lot more subtle change. The print stuff, the tonal contrast, 
Yeah, maybe that's a little bit too much. Color density, that is really subtle. I mean, you've, I'm swinging that over a long range, and you're not really seeing a lot of change. Uh, obviously, if we take the saturation down to zero, we're going to get a black and white look. And the analog range limiter, again, you know, is clamping us down to what looks like an 8-bit image. Um, but <coughs> again, it's what do you think? So here's another example. Um, we're just going to switch it on and off. And in this particular case, I think the thing that we're going to use to try and pull together this, which is another chroma key example, is how we handle things like uh, bloom and halation. So I'm going to have a bit of a swing with halation because I saw some good examples of halation on the Dehancer website. But halation to me, uh, you know, that's a, I've got an interesting relationship with that because to me it reminds me of using old wide angle lenses that used to disappoint you when it come back and had that red fringe on one side and blue fringe on the other side. Uh, so let's just switch out that. Yeah, that looks absolutely dreadful, and it does remind me of the corner. Obviously, that's not a wide-angle shot, but it reminds me of the corner. Anyway, let me just tone it down to see whether anything happens that looks reasonable here. Uh, maybe a little bit too much of it. So um, I just want to see whether it pulls the foreground and the background together. And do you know what? I don't think it does. Uh, but it does do halation, and halation is an effect that you get from light from other layers bouncing into the RGB layers. Uh, bloom, on the other hand, is what happens when it bounces off the rear of the film or your lens is not particularly um, brilliant. So I think from my previous experiments that bloom, a gentle amount of bloom, does bring the foreground and the background together. Um, in this particular case, one of the things that's bothering me is that when I bring on the Hanser, the background image, which has got that kind of uh, corner of the galaxy, the left hand, the left wing of the galaxy there, uh, without the Dehancer plugin, you don't see it. But with the Dehancer plugin, because you're effectively reducing the contrast ratio, you do see it. So I'm just going to have a go at trying to dropping it back to where it should be. But in this particular case, um, I think the image itself gets damaged. I mean, if I think on balance, I think if I really wanted to do that, what I probably do is go to um, the... Uh, timeline where this is constructed so I'm working on the whole timeline here I did try putting the answer on just the foreground or the background in the timelines and that doesn't work it seems to me that the answer has to be applied to the overall footage interesting to see just how jerky the playback is because this is a 28 core MacBook Pro right Let's have a look at uh, another example of pulling things together here. And this is another example where Bloom does a good job. Probably a little bit too much Bloom in there at the moment. Um, but let's just pull that down a little bit. That's too much. That's too much. That's too much. That's too much. I think it's either highlight or details that we need to pull down or... Maybe the amplifier needs to... Let's try the details. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's all I want. I only want bloom on those super bright things. There we go. Let's try switching that on and off. See, that's really subtle, and it does help to soften the foreground background change. Um, and, you know, once you get a little bit of film grain in there, that helps again. So is that pulling the foreground and the background? You know, Are you looking at that and believing... That, that is a reasonably chroma keyed image. Um, yeah, I do. I think it does do a better job. I mean, you are literally dehancing the image to try and blend the two of them together. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Anyway, so one of the final things that we tried was 
what would you you know what could you do could you just quickly add uh the answer to a clip and then oh hang on yeah i'm still trying to get this film grain just as i want it yeah that's about right so one of the other things we tried here is we're looking i'm just switching off on and off the dehancer here just so you can see the effect that it's having you see a lot of it in the scopes you can look at the image and look at the scopes and then uh can we use a couple of nodes of resolve not by using the alpha output by using a couple of nodes of resolve to get roughly the same effect so as i'm flipping between the two of these i can see a slight difference in the grain and i can see a difference in the color temperature so i'm just going to go to this one and uh first of all i'm going to take the um contrast ratio down and secondly i'm going to push the color temperature up by 100 that's it's going to have to be more than 100 the dehancer version which by the way is velvia 50 one of my old favorite films at least 200 here again i still think that that's warmer still think that's warmer so we can take it up again and um, 300 still think that the <coughs> the answer image is warmer but it just seems to go against the gr oh, that's a pun going against the grain it just doesn't seem to be uh, right to push what i know to be right from the camera and meter right anyway let's go look at this grain so let's look at the grain from the hunter and let's look at the grain that i've generated well the grain that i've generated as you know we're not not really seeing it at all so we bring down the texture and that's a very coarse texture compared to the fine texture that you're getting off the answer um but of interest when you go and look at actual velvia film some actual cibachrome prints i don't see any of that kind of grain but it's it's what it looks like aesthetically and as you know as Kova was coming to and fro watching me doing do this she definitely preferred what she saw from dehancer than from what she saw from uh, some of the other things anyway let's try and get out of resolve uh, a finer grain or a finer grain pattern oh, i think this is yes yeah, softest look see the way that's gone there now if we take that down to about there and compare it with what we're getting from dehancer i mean i think even dehancer is still a slightly stronger but the difference between the two is not much. Let's just go to full size now and switch between the resolve version of things and the uh, dehancer version. Okay, so let's try and sum up the dehancer experience. Um, first of all, there are a lot of film profiles in dehancer and i went through the films that i knew some of the kodak films and in particular the velvia film and some of the grainy films and what i found was is that the images that i was seeing on the screen in no way matched the kind of images that i would have been getting out of the actual film printed on cibachrome but does that matter um You'll see, because we're going to close out with a, a, a sequence that I did in the back garden, or we did in the back garden, where I tried to go through all the ages of film uh, to show you, you know, what it would have looked like as you go forward. But that's the only sort of use case I can think of for knowing the names of the films that you're actually using. Another way to look at it is, what does it do for the footage that you've got? And I found that, you know, if I was using it with chroma keyed footage, I could use in particular grain and bloom to tie the images together to make them more believable to sell the shot. Halation was... I saw some beautiful examples of halation on the Dehancer website, but every time I tried to get that kind of uh, halation look, I, I kind of didn't like the look of it the gate and the weave thing 
I think it's okay for emulating vintage film, um, which leaves us really talking about the quality of grain, which is, I would say, outstanding in this plugin. And I know my good friend Anthony says that the um, he, the way that he uses, he says I, I use it for the grain, and I switch off the film emulation. And he particularly likes uh, the exposure controls on it. Anyway, it was interesting to use. It was interesting to be driven down a, a trip down memory lane. And we're going to close out with that sequence about uh, Sarah Angelina Ackland, who would have come to my house many years ago to take some of the first colour photographs ever. Anyway, here's the sequence. We're here in the garden of Thurtover House, which was built in 1901 for, for Sir Reginald Brodie Dyke Ackland and his family. One of the things I've really enjoyed doing in lockdown is researching Sir Reginald and his wider family. The house it sort of encapsulated so many people who were at the fringe of the arts and crafts movement at the turn of the last century. And one of the people that we're going to talk about today is Sarah Angelina Ackland. So Sarah had a quite a privileged upper middle class um, upbringing in Oxford. But one of the things that's quite unexpected about her is that she was one of the first female members of the Royal Photographic Society. Angelina would have come to this garden visiting her brother and she was one of the pioneers of uh, photography. And in those times, it was an acceptable occupation for upper middle class women to be interested in photography. But what was extraordinary is that she became so good that she became a fellow of the Royal Photographic Society by the end of her life. She was so famous and she became so famous that she actually took portraits of people like Gladstone in her lifetime. But more than that, Along with her family, she believed in social equality, science, art, and a new way of creating life and a society. And this led her, when she was older, to start to create her own methods of colour photography, using a three-plate method with a red, green and blue plate overlaid on top of it. If you're interested in seeing some of these photographs, you can go to Oxford, to the Museum of the History of Science, which is a really wonderful place to be and look at them there.